Hi, everyone. Um, it is um, 801 Pacific time and we are just going to give a few more minutes um, and allow a few more attendees and then we'll get started. Okay, uh, Len, I think we're ready to get started. All right, thank you very much. Hello everybody, my name is Len Sancho Lucia. I am the uh, governing board chair for the Linux Foundation Open Mainframe Project. I am standing in today for John Murtick, who is our director. Um, he regrets not being here today uh, due to some other obligations. But uh, we do have a very good agenda put together for you. Uh, as you can see on the charts right in front of you right now, this is what it kind of looks like today. I'll do a little bit of an um, introduction. And then we'll have Joe Bastian talk about Ampetus project inside the Open Mainframe project, uh, the Phalong project by, headed by Mike Friesenberger and uh, Jim James Vincent, uh, Polycephaly by Jerry Edgerton, uh, Zaro by Iran Shaw, Zoe by Sujay Salomon, and Zoe Conformance Program by Joe Winchester and with some discussion about how to get involved and Q&A. Uh, so May, can you move on to the next chart? Uh, the Open Mainframe Project, if you're not familiar with it, is part of the Linux Foundation ecosystem, uh, helping make the mainframe more a part of the uh, open source community uh, through the Open Mainframe Project itself. Uh, and as you can see a little bit about the Linux Foundation, I remember when it was first starting out myself, uh, back when I was still uh, working at IBM, uh, when IBM decided to get involved with the uh, uh, Linux movement back in 1999, 2000 timeframe. I remember when I first had the chance to shake hands with uh, Linus Torvalds himself on stage at the Javits Center, and it started from there, uh, along with uh, the CEO of IBM at the time, Sam Palmazano. Uh, it's uh, really working at uh, uh, very, very well, and we, we have many, many projects uh, in and around the Open Mainframe project, but look at all uh, of some of the lists down below. Uh, as you can see at the bottom of the chart for the uh, Linux Foundation itself. There are quite a few things uh, going on with this organization as a whole, and uh, the Open Mainframe Project is one of the most successful projects inside the Linux Foundation today. Uh, next chart, please. Uh, our objective in the Open Mainframe Project is really tr um, designed for uh, eliminating any barriers to open source adoption on the platform, uh, demonstrating value of the mainframe on a technical and business levels, uh, 
and perspectives, and also strengthening the collaboration points and resources throughout the community so it thrives. I have to say that, uh, as you'll see, there are, uh, I remember when it was first starting out, we had like one or two projects, but it has grown tremendously. As you can see from the evidence today of what we have to talk with you today with the different heads of each of the projects. Uh, next chart, please. Um, it's been four years. Uh, I've been lucky to be part of it the entire four years. Uh, there are uh, 36 and more coming organizations involved, as you can see from the list below. Uh, nine projects together. I believe it's going to jump up to 11 in the not too distant future. Uh, we have uh, mentored uh, over 36 mentees in the annual uh, internship program that the Linux Foundation Open Mainframe Project uh, sponsors, uh, and we have impacted over 100 plus students. I had the privilege of a few of the years uh, of running the internship program, working with some very, very bright students uh, and watching them learn and become uh, acclimated and knowledgeable about the platform. Uh, there are, uh, here are some of the projects, as you can see here listed, and we're going to go through them uh, one at a time. Each of them will be explained by each of the presenters responsible for them. And uh, I think you can go on to the next chart. Uh, and you can take a look at our website, at openmainframeproject.org, where you can take a look at one nice uh, view, uh, all of the information, uh, and click on each of these things and get involved and get be part of the uh, supported projects, uh, be involved with uh, anything and at all different kinds of levels, whether it be projects, Linux distributions, or open mainframe project member membership is also explained there. There are different levels, uh, silver all the way to platinum, and of which we have many of those folks on here today. Uh, next chart, please. So what I'd like to do now is turn it over to Joe Bastian. Joe uh, is uh, someone at IBM that's been involved with the architecture of the IBM Z and helps lead the Ambitus program, uh, project, excuse me, inside the Open Mainframe project. Joe, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, thanks a lot, Lynn. So uh, the Ambitus project uh, is a relatively new project. We announced it uh, in late February this year, and uh, it's a project that, that, um, that aims to do a, a couple of different things, to reach two different kinds of personas in the open source community. The first is that we wanna reach out to application um, uh, architects, workload architects, who work in an enterprise environment, who may have workloads spread across multiple nodes in their enterprise, and who use uh, common open source tool chains, pipelines, CI, CD frameworks, things like that, uh, and they want to understand better how their, their mainframe fits into that environment and, and also understand how they can make use of that as they would uh, any other node in their enterprise. So this project really aims to sort of give people a starting place to discover the capabilities of open source on ZOS uh, and Linux on Z. Um, this is definitely certainly uh, slanted and focused towards ZOS. But as we work more and more in the open source space, we find all sorts of opportunities to, uh, to share with the Linux, our Linux on Z um, um, cousins. Uh, and, and we also are able to go off and, and share workloads between uh, ZOS nodes and Linux on Z nodes as well. So we really want people who are unfamiliar with the IBM Z platform to have a place where they can come and discover 
um, hey, I didn't know, you know, this particular uh, open source package ran on this platform. Uh, I have that as part of my tool chain. Perhaps I can start distributing some work over to the mainframe for this particular purpose and achieve some efficiencies that today perhaps aren't impl implemented in the best particular way. So we're really reaching out to those workload architects who are um, familiar with the open source environment, who really want to um, best understand how to distribute workloads around and start including uh, their mainframe as, as part of, of, of those distributed uh, work and tool chains. Uh, the second set of folks that we're really trying to, to look out to is those who perhaps maybe know something about IBM Z, perhaps even have a project that is running on ZOS or Z Linux, and they want to look for an avenue to, uh, to publicize that and to make that available to the open source community. So if you have some kind of a, a project that you think would best fit in an open source environment and you want to understand how you can share that with a community that understands the mainframe that already is a uh, perhaps a ready consumer of, of your particular uh, the function that you want to make available and you're trying to understand how can I get started. Um, this is a this could serve as a portal where you can find other people who have similar interests and you don't have to say, well, I'll open a, a, a GitHub repo and maybe create an org out there, but nobody's ever going to uh, discover this or, or, or find out that this project really exists. So we also want to be able to, um, to sort of uh, create a home for those, those kinds of folks who are looking to perhaps open source a new project that they're thinking about and, uh, and work with, with people who are trying to bring open source packages over to the platform and haven't yet been able to upstream that or convince the open source community that the IBM Z platform is one that's, uh, that's worth uh, supporting. So say for instance, you brought a package over to ZOS or Z Linux, you want the rest of the world to know about it, you can open a pull request with the original upstream project and that's fine, but a lot of times it will sit there and it will take a long time for that to get through. In the meantime, you could stage that same code out to a repo that's hosted under the Amatus project, and you could you could point people to that and say, simply do a pull on uh, you know on this particular repo, and and you can see how it works. Again, this is about establishing a community of of people with common interests, ones who say know something about mainframes in general, uh, but have a deep open source background, and the idea is that by building this community, we wanna sort of create a portal or a center of gravity where it's easy to find the resources that you need in order to be successful in an open source environment. So that's really what we wanna do um, in a nutshell. Uh, we, this, this necessarily means that we will perform a lot of different functions and a lot of different roles under the umbrella of Ambitus and the Open Mainframe Project. But again, it's, it's as much as anything, a project designed to facilitate uh, uh, people who have an open source, um, an open source facet to whatever it is that they're doing, and they want that to run on the mainframe. So, if you're if you're someone in that position, if you're someone who um, assumes that role or persona within your organization, and you just didn't know how to get started, um, take a look at the Ambitus project. As I said, it's relatively new. We're still adding content, and we're coming up to speed, uh, but we want to build this out quickly and establish a robust community. So that's it in a nutshell. So, Joe, just a quick question from me, Len. Sure. Would you look at Ambitus as like a index to going into the open source available or wanting to become available on the mainframe? Is that yeah. is it like the index sure. to it? Is that what you look at it as? Yeah, um, an index. Um, an index is a term that you know can have a, a very well-defined meaning. Um, ideally, it would be nice if we did have an index and say you can come here like uh, you could to a pypy.org, where you could go in and search: Are all these projects available to run on Z, uh, Z Linux or ZOS? And and we have kicked around ideas like that. Um, that is a a, a tall order. Um, coming up with an official index or a, a place where you could search for things. Is, um, is perhaps something that is an aspirational goal in the long term, 
but certainly we'd want this to be uh, something that people think about or if they search on the web, they could easily discover themselves and then come here and, uh, and find out more about, about what's available and what's running. That sounds like a very good starting point. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks, Len. Sure. So with that, um, I'll turn this over to, to Philong. Uh, I think it's uh, James is next, or, or I think James yeah. is next. Actually, um, this is, thanks, Joe. Mike, this is yeah. Mike, Mike Friesen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, Mike. Uh, let me go ahead and start, and then absolutely have James introduce himself as well. So hello, okay, everyone. Right. Um, my name is Mike Friesenegger, and uh, I, with James, am, am a, a co-chair of the Thalong Project. Uh, I'm a solution architect at SUSE. Uh, I work uh, very closely uh, on the SUSE IBM partnership, and I work with many groups in IBM, including the IBM Z and uh, Linux One teams. James, you want to go ahead and take a moment to introduce yourself? Certainly. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I am James Vincent. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a senior architect with Velocity Software. And I'm a product owner for a cloud management solution that um, I have a, a, a high interest in, in what we're doing with this Phalong project to open up the ZVM platform. Um, it's, been a, it's been a great ride and um, the leadership around the open mainframe has, has made this project quite successful. Thanks, James. All right, next slide, thank you. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the Phalong project. Um, first of all, um, we have nearly 40 people on Slack that are following the project, and that number is growing. Uh, we're focused on contributing and further developing the Python ZVM SDK code base, which uses Linux on Z and runs on Linux on Z, and is a RESTful API implementation that uh, simplifies the interaction with IBM uh, ZVM hypervisor. Um, the, the RESTful API allows uh, for development of infrastructure as a service automation uh, for, for VMs, networking, storage that are, that are used and managed by ZVM. So if you're somebody that is um, not familiar with the ZVM hypervisor and how to interact with the ZVM hypervisor, you still need people that understand that. But if you know how to develop in RESTful APIs and be able to do puts and gets and, uh, and all of that good stuff, you'll be able to take advantage of the Python ZVM SDK code base to be able to interact with ZVM, create guests, uh, create networks, uh, define storage, and things like that. Um, the the Phalong project is also has been known as the ZVM Cloud Connector. It's been around for a little bit. Um, it, it actually started out as a project by IBM, and IBM has contributed it to the Open Mainframe project under the Linux Foundation. Um, there are a number of commercial products and open source projects that use the Python ZVM SDK code base. Uh, so you, an organization can develop their own infrastructure as a service automation, or they can take advantage of a commercial product or open source project to be able to do that. So <clears throat> what's next for Phalong? Um, well, it, because it started out as a contribution from IBM and now it's fully open source under the Phalong project, there are things that need to be moved, like the uh, CI-CD infrastructure. So we're in the process of moving the CI-CD infrastructure into the project under the Linux Foundation. Um, at the same time, we need to connect the CI-CD infrastructure to Z resources that are contributed by member organizations. <clears throat> and, and those Z resources will allow the CI-CD infrastructure to do the building of the packages, do the testing, and, and things like that. Another important goal of Phalong is to give developers access to resources if they're interested in contributing to this project. Um, Developers are going to need access to ZVM infrastructure. So we're working again with those member organizations to provide ZV, ZVM resources so that those developers can develop their new feature or, a, or make a change to an existing feature. They can test that feature and, and, and absolutely provide documentation on the feature. 
So with, the, with those resources in place, the CICD infrastructure and the ability for developers to get access to resources, um, it, it makes it easier for the project to support activities like the, the OMP summer intern program that Len mentioned earlier, and, and projects that will contribute to Feilong. And, um, and there is a project that actually I'm listing here on, on the slide um, that is part of this coming summer uh, mentorship program, and it's focused on Ansible automation of Feilong. Um, uh, and, and so we're really excited to be able to support that project. Last and, and maybe uh, and not the least, but I think it's actually the most it's the most uh, important activity that we need to focus on is increasing the Feilong membership. And we have biweekly meetings, and I would love to see that meeting attendance grow. Next slide, please. So uh, here are two examples of the type of discussions that you can find if you attend one of our biweekly meetings. Uh, the left screenshot is, is from a Feilong contributor that uh, showed off what he's working on and will soon be contributing to the project. As you can see, it, has to, it deals with SCSI um, and automation of, 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 of uh, configuring and deploying SCSI disks for virtual machines. Um, based on his presentation, which was awesome, and every session that we do is recorded, so you can go back and see his presentation and demonstration. But based on that, uh, um, other members were already starting to kick around ideas how they can expand on his contribution once it's available. On the right-hand side, the Linux Foundation infrastructure team um, presented a proposal to the Feilong project for our CICD transformation and, and getting it into and under the Linux Foundation uh, that I spoke about earlier. So again, that was recorded, uh, um, great information. It's great to see how the Linux Foundation supports uh, the Open Mainframe project and the sub-projects like Feilong uh, that, that need resources to be able to continue to move this project forward. So uh, in, in closing, I, I'm really excited about the Feilong project, and, and we're excited to be an incubation project underneath the Open Mainframe project. But honestly, we'd like to graduate to an active status. Uh, to do that, though, we need more community involvement and, and, and help uh, um, people that are interested in the Feilong project uh, um, you know, join the biweekly meetings, get involved, join the, the mailing list, get on the Slack channel, chat with us. We're happy to, uh, to get you engaged and, and help you better understand what Feilong is all about. And with that, I'd like to move on to the next slide and thank everyone for their time. Um, now it's time to turn it over to Jerry with the uh, Polycephaly Project. Thank you. Sorry, thanks Mike, I was on mute. <laughs> um, thanks everyone. Uh, my name is Jerry Edgington. I'm a senior systems analyst uh, with Western and Southern Financial Group. However, that's my day job. This is my off day job, I guess I should say. Um, I have been working on this project for about four and a half years um, just because it was some things that we wanted to, I saw some gaps that I really wanted to work on with this. So if you go to the next slide, please. So why did I do this project? This, is, this has been my baby from day one. Um, I'm still the, main, the only developer on it, but what I wanted to do is to be able to treat developers as developers, not mainframe developers. I also wanted to make sure, I see we got a duplicate on this, sorry about the slide. I wanted to, re, to not increase the load on a systems programmer to make this easy for somebody to work on it. I also wanted to reuse the existing Jenkins get knowledge to be able to support the platform. So what I want to do is just basically allow a developer sitting at a, on his favorite IDE, just like a normal developer off the, main, off the platform would be doing, develop their code, save it, go on to the next thing, run it through a C, CTCI process on Jenkins, goes to source goes to get, but still not lose the, um, the some of the mainframes, the ZOS kind of functions that we have. Like one of the big things was disaster recovery. We need those, we really don't want to rely on the server to have the get process up, so where are the PDSs at? So that's 
that's part of the project. So the main, the main benefits of this is, like I said, very minimal ZOS systems programming, very minimal ZOS overhead. It only goes to ZOS when it needs to. So it treats ZOS just like any other platform using the same tools. You can use Jira, Jenkins, Git. You can use all of those tools with the ZOS systems programming or with ZOS um, development. So it actually tries to reuse what's already existing in the open source world like Jenkins and Git for the platform. It also would allow a non-ZOS systems program or non-ZOS application developer to develop on ZOS. So let me go back a step. Why the name polycephaly? So the name polycephaly is means something with two heads. So what this project, the reason I called it this was, this project has two heads. So it has the distributed side, methodology for, for developing code and deploying code, building code, where it has ZOS has a totally different methodology where the system that the uh, application developer doesn't know the process behind the scenes, doesn't know how to build it through like something like a mainframe SCM. So trying to marry those two together was why it's called polycephaly. So this project basically is an extension of, I guess what you would call it Jenkins or the open source or distributed platform development. So where is this, where is this project coming to play? So basically when you get the project, you have Jenkins and get already running, you have the, the COS slave working, you would need something like IBM's dependency-based build. Sorry, I can't get around that, it's IBM's code, it's IBM's system. Once you get that up and running and able to run some of the IBM sample DBB code, this would be the add-on to allow you to do builds on ZOS for an application. So COBOL, Assembler, EasyTree, some of the other third-party products. So this would actually uh, help you get jumpstart that conversion. So get it into the get, get it into the repository, get it in, up to ZOS. So it allows you to streamline from the point where the IBM DBB or the Jenkins and get code is already running and exploit it on ZOS to be able to do the builds and compiles. So that's kind of where we're at with the project. Um, like like anything, any other uh, open mainframe projects, you can get the polycephaly code, download it off the website, you can install it, run as a get. This code is installed by Jenkins, it is upgraded by Jenkins, it is delivered by Jenkins just like any other Jenkins application. The mainframe applications would call this application to actually do the builds. So, and there's a lot of information on the website under the open mainframe project on the bottom line. So, what do we wanna do with this code? I'm limited by what I can do on my system. So, we're working with people like Len and a few others to try and get this code out where it's available to be able to be enhanced. So we're looking to expand that, add more features, functions, subsystems like DB2 since my shop doesn't have DB2. We're also looking to integrate it with Jenkins better. The CID, the CI, uh, the pipeline functions, CI, CD functions, exploit more of its features, including Jira, adding more functionality so this wouldn't be a much easier transition to be able to go to. Also, uh, documentation is not one of my favorite things, so also improve the documentation to help use for easier installation and transition to polycephaly. So that was probably less than five minutes, but I wanted to give some time back for the others because my project's pretty straightforward and simple. So with that, I will turn it over to Heron for, with Zorro. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, Heron, before you uh, speak, I wanted to make a comment on both Jerry's uh, presentation and Mike's and James. Um, Jerry, thank you for reminding me. We have made um, uh, some LPARs available to both uh, Jerry and Mike uh, so that uh, on our IBM Z, our, our IBM Z system is uh, harbored in New York and um, that's uh, for projects of all kinds, development and experimentation, evaluation and we're we're helping uh, these two projects, uh, and we are possibly going to be doing some others. Um, and uh, it seems to be working out well. So we have a, a real Z to work on, 
uh, with with these project and others as as and if and when needed. So thank you, Jerry, for reminding me about that. Oh, by the way, my day job is CTO and business development manager for uh, Viacom Infinity, IBM Z business partner based out of New York. Uh, so Aaron, please go ahead. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Aaron Shaw from IBM Poughkeepsie. Um, my day job is I'm a cloud enablement architect for ZUS. And uh, today I would like to talk to you about Zoro. Um, next slide. Zoro stands for um, ZUS Open Repository of Workflows. So our mission is to provide a repository for um, ZUS system programmers and ZUS um, software vendors uh, such that they can co contribute and collaborate um, creating and sharing ZUSMF workflows. Um, we would like to build a community of uh, system programmers so that uh, they collaborate around ZUSMF workflow technology. They have a, a vast knowledge on system management skills and uh, we would like them to share that skills um, among each other uh, in ZUSMF workflow manner. Um, the final vision is to help our system programmer to manage the system, ZUS system in a modernized way using modern technology uh, and behind the cover, ZUSMF and ZUSMF workflows are, are key to um, ZUS modernization. So that, that uh, uh, is our main mission to encourage a ZUS system programmer to build um, and share their workflows through this Zorro repository to help out each other uh, manage their system in, uh, in a more modern way um, through the ZUSMF workflow. The benefit we are seeing with the Zorro is we will have now centralized repository where uh, customers uh, and, and our vendors are sharing their workflows uh, along with uh, many IBM offerings uh, who are also currently sharing their, their configuration workflows, their system management workflows. So IBM has already started uh, posting the workflows. We have a customer, one customer who is sharing um, um, their workflows through Zorro repository. So the benefit is having one place that that uh, customer can go and uh, collaborate for his USMF workflow to perform their uh, most common system management task. Um, Next benefit is system programmers would be able to collaborate on various workflows to reduce their complexity by um, uh, picking up the familiarized templates from the Zoro, in integrating those uh, 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 sample workflows into their processes that they are performing day to day uh, in more efficient and um, 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 simplified manners. Um, and the, finally, our ZUS system programmers, senior system programmers who have acquired abundance of system management skill over a number of years, we would like to encourage them and energize them to transfer that skills that they have acquired over a number of years to document and to, to put those skills in the ZUSMF workflow form and share it with the Zorro. So early tenure system programmer can benefit with that and, and understand uh, the complex ZUS management um, that is now centralized in ZUSMF workflows. And I will go over um, um, quickly in next slide, what is the um, um, ZUSMF workflow is. Uh, so, uh, 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 sorry, can you go back to the pre uh, previous one? Sorry, yeah. Uh, the, what's next for us for the Zoro project? Uh, well, we would like to cont continue to build the portfolio of various system management and configuration workflow. IBM will continue to um, contribute to this um, repository, but we also would like to encourage our customers uh, and, and, and our vendor community to participate and contribute uh, workflows that they are using in their shop or, or they can create the workflows for um, uh, uh, modernizing that, their management processes and, and, and share with other customer how they are doing it in their shop. Um, and also, uh, uh, we would like we would be providing some additional education material through videos and, and things like that that would help our customer to build their own uh, ZUSMF workflows. So that that would be our next step. But main thing over here is 
we would like to encourage our customers and vendors to participate in this community, share their workflows, uh, learn from each other. If they have any questions, they can post it on our Slack, join our mailing list, and, and ask uh, if they have any um, issues creating the workflow, they need additional um, uh, skills creating the workflow, we are here to help them. Um, next slide, please. So what is a ZUSMF workflow? In a, in a very quick overview I would like to provide is that it's a framework that is uh, to support our system programmer, um, including our middleware system programmer, to define a guided flow uh, through the steps in the workflow to accomplish a specific system management or specific product configuration task that, that they are currently doing, running, set of jobs uh, either manually or through some scripting um, on, on our ZUS side using some 3270 interfaces. So instead of that, uh, incorporate those jobs that they have into this uh, guided flow that, uh, that, that, that is created through ZUSMF workflow. This ZUSMF workflow is useful to assist uh, our early tenure system programmer who are unfamiliar with how to perform a given task or even a current season um, senior system programmer who are performing some task on a rarely basis. So they have to remember a kind of how to uh, perform specific system management activity. Uh, they would, uh, uh, these workflows will help them to, to consolidate those steps that they are currently doing in, in one place. So they don't have to um, uh, struggle through how to perform those system management tasks. Uh, workflow ensures that all tasks are performed in the right order and uh, only when th that dependency um, are met. Uh, so specific step, for example, requires uh, some other steps to complete uh, our workflow process will guarantee that that happens. Um, we will make sure through workflow processing that all the steps are completed before a specific task is um, considered to be complete. So if you're performing a manage system management activity, when all the steps part of the that workflow are complete, uh, regardless who has to run those tasks, sometimes in a system management activity, you will uh, involve more than one persona to perform that system management activity. And workflow will assist with that, as well as when all the personas has completed that task, then the specific system configuration or management activity is considered complete. Uh, it will help you monitor and progress uh, towards the completion of that task, um, system management task. Uh, and there is a history and audit capability with the workflow that, that in a most ZUS shop, uh, they have to provide uh, some auditing to, about specific activity that is performed, uh, system management activity that was performed by system programmer and ZUSMF workflow can assist with that. And when you have to perform the same task on multiple system, having a workflow that consolidates all of the steps and provides you ability to run those steps on a multiple systems, it becomes more um, efficient um, to, to run a workflow through ZUSMF on multiple system and achieve uh, your system configuration activity on multiple systems. Current examples, we have um, ZUS middleware provisioning um, that is happening through workflow, DB2, WebSphere, uh, IMS, MQ, all major middlewares, CICS, all major, all major middleware of ZUS are providing the workflow that are hosted in, in this Zoro community that would help you configuring and provision this middleware. Uh, other examples are like expanding the ZFS file system, which are more like day-to-day -day administration of ZUS, upgrading the ZUS version. We have workflows for all those scenarios and, and many more that I have not listed here. Uh, so that's a very high level overview of the workflow. Uh, we can work with you to uh, help you building your own workflows. Uh, um, please join this community. And, and we can learn from each other. Thank you. Um, our next um, discussion is around Zoe and Sujay uh, Solomon will, will, will take, take over from here. All right, thank you so much, Hiran. Um, I'll just start by saying, I hope everyone is, is safe during the pandemic. I'm, I'm glad you're on this webinar uh, with us. So my name is Sujay Solomon. I work for Broadcom as the chief Z DevOps advocate. Uh, I'm also part of the Open Mainframe Project Zoe Leadership Committee, uh, just a member. So I'm really here representing Zoe and all the folks in, in ZLC. Uh, and the ZLC is made up of members from Rocket Software, IBM, and, and Broadcom. Uh, 
Uh, next slide, please, May. So what is our, our mission here? Um, with Zoe, which was launched you know, a couple of years ago uh, by uh, the combination of IBM Broadcom Rocket Software, we really wanted to you know, lower the learning curve. So with, with new folks coming onto the platform, it should not take them you know, six months to become productive. It needs to be quicker. Second thing we wanted to do was actually attract and retain new people on the platform on ZOS. Uh, we were noticing that you know, new people coming to the platform, uh, they, would, you know, they would work for a few months and they kind of feel like the tooling is outdated or they don't really see much of a future in a, in a career there and, and would maybe leave the platform after a little while. And we really wanted to attract folks and retain them. And the third thing is to simplify the architecture of, Zo uh, of, of ZOS so that it's more accessible, uh, that people without deep ZOS knowledge are able to actually uh, build applications and such that take advantage of services running on ZOS. So these are the mission and the goals that we had when we launched Zoe. In terms of components that exist in Zoe today, We've got the command line interface, which is a scriptable interface that you install on your local machines, your clients, uh, and it's able to you know, call REST APIs on the mainframe to give you access to commands, just like how many popular cloud platforms have it. We also have an API mediation layer that helps you with, uh, which runs on ZOS and helps you with centralizing access to REST APIs on ZOS, uh, especially for the purpose of infrastructure software. So, you know, maybe I'm accessing ZOSMF, maybe I'm accessing some vendor tooling like Endeavor or some, something like that. Those APIs can all flow through the mediation layer, uh, which is just, you know, typical best practice when it comes to exposing REST APIs from a single platform. And then uh, we also have a desktop UI, uh, a web UI, which uh, allows folks to access all kinds of resources on ZOS from the comfort of a browser. So they don't even need to log into 3270. They just go to a browser and they have quick access to common things that you'd wanna do on the platform, like looking at jobs and looking at uh, files, data sets, and so on. We also have a Visual Studio Code extension uh, which is the most popular text editor uh, pseudo IDE in the world today. And that thing is, has grown in popularity quite a bit uh, that actually uses a lot of the APIs and, and some of the code that was borrowed from CLI. So it's, it's really a prime example of open source uh, building something out that is um, heavily adopted and, and contributed from various parties. So when it was donated to Zoe, it really didn't have that much, but the open source community really got together and promoted it, built it up to be something much bigger. Some benefits and you know, uh, what we offer from Zoe is consistent access to the ZOS platform systems and services. Uh, and it's not just UI or CLI, we're also offering programmatic interfaces like SDKs, which are coming up next. Uh, we want to make sure that we're leveraging industry standard methodologies and standards. So we don't want to invent new standards for ZOS. We want to make sure that we just work with uh, popular methodologies that integrate with things that today's developers and IT folks already do. And when it comes to building APIs, exposing UI or exposing command line interface and IDE extensions, we are aiming for Zoe to be the absolute standard within the ZOS community. So that is uh, a mission and a goal of, of Zoe. What's coming up in Zoe? Uh, we've got lined up. Uh, we want to build an SSO experience for all users of, of ZOS. So whether you're accessing specific vendor tooling uh, or if you're accessing parts of the operating system, when you need to sign in, you do it once and your context is saved for your session so that you don't have to log in again. That's an experience we're driving towards. Uh, we're also aiming to provide SDKs for popular languages like Python, Node.js, and in the future, hopefully Java and so on, uh, which really abstracts the REST API. So you don't have to code to the REST APIs. I just import a library in uh, if I'm writing a Node app or a Python app, and there you go. I've got all my uh, uh, functions and everything I need to access services on ZOS already. 
And the third one I've got here is a, is a mobile framework for ZOS services. Uh, that's an incubation project that we've got in Zoe today. Uh, hasn't graduated yet, but in, in growing stage. And then I also want to share with the Zoe web desktop, uh, we are coming up with ways where the themes within the desktop are actually customizable. So people have their favorite ways of looking at things on the browser within UIs, and we're making those themes customizable in the web desktop now. Next slide, please. So in terms of the activity that we've got going on in Zoe, we have more than 200 committers, unique committers across all of our repositories. Uh, we have 96 Git repositories under github.com slash Zoe. And we have over 21,000 commits. So uh, you know, lots of growth, lots of continued activi activity around the project. And in terms of how folks are actually using this, so you've got, you know, if you look at the cloud platforms, there's API, CLI, web GUI, and they've got IDE extensions. We've really just replicated that. We've taken that same model and we've implemented that for mainframe. And we do that uh, while keeping mainframe ZOS security in place. So anybody who can access things using TSO ISPF interfaces, their same user ID, their same security profiles are in place. But what this allows people to do whether you're a developer or you're a DevOps person, you're a system administrator, is the use of modern off-platform tools, uh, things like Jenkins and, and uh, scripting languages like Python or JMeter and so on, uh, or you know, from a browser being able to look at uh, resources regardless of what browser it is and so on. So that type of openness is what we're doing with uh, Zoe. Next slide, please. And specifically for the DevOps side, uh, you know, Jerry was mentioning things like Jenkins. So the, the command line interface and the APIs can be used to build CI CD pipelines, uh, build automated testing, or if you wanna, you know, integrate your, your uh, the source that's on the mainframe with uh, scanning tools like SonarCube, all of that is possible through scripting. Right. Next slide, please. And if you're a developer, you want to use modern IDEs like Visual Studio Code, uh, you want to use task runners like Gulp and so on, and it opens the doors for them uh, through the VS Code extension or the CLI. And next slide. And we've got uh, system administrators as well. So as I mentioned before, the web desktop is a perfect place for them to you know, graphically go look at the resources for, for ZOS and, uh, you know, System admins also are developers in some way. So a lot of them also want to use things like the VS Code extension or from tools like ServiceNow, they call straight into the APIs and build self-service for, uh, for their users. So if I want to maybe refresh some test data that's uh, on, on my production system and I want to automate that request, those things can be automated using these APIs. Next slide, please. And in terms of if you want to get started, we've got a website, zoe.org. Uh, we had over, you know, close to 30 sessions at Share recently. Uh, we have also have a Medium website, uh, so medium.com slash Zoe. Lots and lots of blogs, ex excellent content out there. Um, would be a great place to just go and educate yourself about what people are doing with Zoe. Uh, we have, you know, more than 250 followers on LinkedIn and just, uh, we have 400 plus members on the Zoe user channel. So Slack has really grown in terms of, a, of an integration point for us. So I'd welcome folks to go to the website, download it, use it. Uh, or if you wanna come work with us, you know, come to GitHub, all of our issues are over there or join us on Slack to become active. And with that, I'll hand it over to Joe Winchester who's gonna go over the Zoe conformance program. Thanks. Before awesome you uh, say something, Joe, I was going to add a comment. Um, if anybody might be interested, uh, a very nice Zoe use case uh, happens to be something that our company developed called Vicom Infinity Voice Assistant. You're all familiar with Alexa and Google Home. It uses Zoe to uh, actually be able to talk and command uh, the mainframe via voice in a secure manner. Uh, more details some other time, but just thought I'd mention that. Uh, there, and there's many others that are out there uh, that are coming along very nicely out there. So Joe, back to you, sorry to interrupt. Any problem then, awesome. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So that actually leads quite nicely into what I was gonna talk about next, which is when I, oh, thanks, you've advanced the slide, great. 
So I'm going to talk about the Zoe Conformance program. I'll give a little bit of background beforehand. Um, I, when I describe Zoe, sometimes I say to people, think of your phone or think of your laptop computer. Or um, my background before I worked on Zoe, I worked on Eclipse, which is a very successful open source tooling platform. And before that, I worked in Java, which is a very successful open source project. And the success of both of those two projects and possibly the success of a phone or um, an operating system or a computer, when you buy it or, a, or, or are given it, it comes with stuff. Out of the box, a phone has a bunch of apps, a compass, a calculator, a web browser. Um, you know, you can make phone calls on a phone as well, which is quite nice, but you can extend it. You can extend it through a marketplace, through an app store, through uh, there is a community of people uh, some, um, you know, vendors, existing vendors, some new vendors, and the community of people who extend your platform is really the longevity and the vitality and the success of your platform. And this has repeated itself throughout history. If you, um, I'm old enough uh, to have worked on, you know, when Windows was up against uh, IBM OS2 Warp platform, uh, you can think of um, other formats, VHS versus Betamax, so on and so forth. Coffee, coffee pods was, you know, whoever becomes the best is the one that has the most uh, coffee providers put coffee in the pods that fit a particular coffee maker and so forth. So the success of Zoe, we recognize as an open source, is not just the success of what you get in base Zoe, but the extra stuff. And Len just talked about a really good sample there, which was great, where uh, they were able to actually get an Alexa client talking to uh, the, the mainframe through Zoe. And I think there was a, a great demo done where you could ask it questions like say, um, you know, how's my SLA? How's my service license agreement? It, there was voice recognition and it replied to you using the Zoe APIs. And it's, what's really nice is when, when we see people coming along with really novel use cases. So um, the Zoe conformance program, um, so I'll just read out what I've got on the charts. So reiterate, it was designed and architected for people to build plugins, to build apps and build extensions. Now, that is a gift and a curse, because if you think about your phone or your operating system, um, you want to make sure that when you're using it and you go and get an extension, that that extension is, is nicely behaved. It's not going to collide with other extensions you've already got, and it's got a level of you know, fit and finish, and, and um, it's, it's, it's something uh, pleasing and good. And you see this with people who create app stores for mobile phones and things. There is a sort of set of criteria that people have to pass. So this is what the conformance program is about. Um, so it gives users who've installed the base Zoe confidence that something that they get that sort of orbits Zoe and, and benefits from Zoe's core capabilities is well behaved and well formed. And it also gives those people building those extensions confidence that their extension will not be broken because Customers will install one version of Zoe software and then they might take patches and upgrade that going forward um, over time. And just like if you take um, an upgrade in your operating system, you wouldn't want a bunch of apps in it to stop working. You, uh, um, you would want those to stay working. So we have to make sure that the APIs and the programmatic um, interfaces that we publish to help people to extend Zoe, that they're solid and uh, we don't remove them and we don't break them. So it basically is the kind of uh, ironwork that makes sure that that community, the users enjoying the base product and the users enjoying the apps and the people building those apps can kind of operate together with, with, with some sort of um, you know, form and shape around them. Okay, next slide, please. So that's the why, the Zoe Conformance Program. Now I'll give a, a couple of samples that I'm quite limited for time, so I'll just rattle through a few quick ones. Suja mentioned the Zoe command line interface. Now it's interesting because I remember presenting Zoe once at a, a conference and some, we, we, we went off with the modern face of the mainframe and people came up and there was someone at the back of the room who, when they saw the command line interface, uh, they got quite upset. They said, modern, you know, this is a text interface, give me a break. And as Sute pointed out, it's actually very important. Command line interface is very important for scripting, for automation, uh, for repeatability and reliability. And if you look at, I use Git, I use Docker and things like that. If you use AWS, Amazon Web Services and stuff, you drive a lot of those through a CLI. So this is a thoroughly modern. What's really nice about the Zoe command line interface, uh, I've got three little, so, so right at the top, I've got on the top left, I, I, if I don't know my syntax, I just say Zoe files. 
I can say Zoe beforehand and it will tell me that I can do stuff with files. And then instantly it says, oh, what do I want to do with the file? And these were a list of commands. Now these are quite familiar commands. They're sort of user friendly. And then I see, oh, I've got one called DS. So I get Zoe files list. And then I start typing it and very quickly I can get my samples. It's what's known for people to write help text as progressive discovery of information. So if you think about the internet and really successful web browsers like perhaps Google Chrome, for example, it doesn't tell you anything until you start giving it information. And as you give it information, it reveals to you what it is that you're likely to want to do next. This is built into the command line interface because it's backed by a really powerful framework called Imperative. And on the right hand corner, I've got the fact that you can actually go in and there's actually web help. You can just crank up the web help directly in the laptop or you can actually browse it online which lets you do a full searching of all of your commands. Okay, so that's in the CLI. Next slide, please. Now, as an extensible platform, the base CLI lets you do commands on ZOS, but when, you talk, when I talk about the ecosystem, I've just listed a few examples here. Um, on the top left, there's a plugin for uh, MQ. MQ is a very successful messaging um, product that's um, it's cross-platform. It's very successful on the mainframe. Now on npmjs.org, because it's built in Node and Node has a package manager, uh, just a, a few things. So you can see the command Zoe MQ run, and it, I can run an MQSC command. So if I'm doing scripting, if I'm doing automation from my uh, machine that's got Node running on it, I can just type in this. And this behaves and operates exactly the same way as a base CLI plugin. So if you're used to using the base CLI, an imperative is giving you this progressive discovery text, you can do all of this within here. Next slide, please. Just keeping an eye on time. So we also has a Zoe desktop. The Zoe desktop has a bunch of really useful apps in here. Three you'll see really quickly. A 3270 emulator runs in a browser, a file explorer, a Jazz explorer, very rich experiences. People who are used to using ISPF 3.4, 3.17. There's rich GUIs and older GUIs, but bottom left-hand corner, available apps. This is an extensible thing. So you can build apps that extend into the Zoe desktop. And next slide, please. And these are the Zoe conformant offerings. So these are the number of apps we had uh, last year in 2019. Uh, there's a new Zoe conformance program coming in for our, what's called our, uh, our long-term support release of Zoe. So these vendors, you see uh, IBM, Rocket, um, a CA Broadcom, Phoenix Software, and there are others coming up as well. A couple of really interesting things about it. Once you pass the criteria and you're a well-formed um, offering that's either a CLI extension that lets you enjoy all the benefits of the imperative framework in the CLI or an app that lets you work in the desktop in a very nice way and you play nicely with single sign-on and some of the other frameworks like that and there's you can just surface your raw APIs if you want to into an API catalog that's there you'll get a badge and that badge gives users confidence that your app is well formed on top of the Zoe platform and it gives you confidence that Zoe, base Zoe is not gonna break you going forward because the APIs you've used, and there are other things in the conformance program about you have to uh, you know, provide the, the documentation and support, you have to be a, a, you know, a clean, well-behaved, uh, well-presented application. Len, I'm just gonna hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Joe. So folks, as we close out the day here, <clears throat> you will find other open mainframe projects and contacts here information. Uh, this will all be posted along with the uh, 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 recorded recording of the session. And um, being that we're right at the top of the hour, uh, let me say this, that if there are any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, any of us that have spoken, I want to thank all of the speakers. I'd like to thank the uh, open mainframe project team, May and Chris, for helping facilitate and make this such a success. As you can see, the mainframe is very modern, and when you take that into consideration, especially with the new IBM Z15 family that was recently announced, uh, there is just nothing else like it on the platform, and open source is just the proverbial icing on this cake. So with that, uh, I'd like to close the session and wish everybody well. Please stay healthy, uh, safe, 
hopeful, and most of all, smiling. Positivity is how we're going to get through this. Thank you, and have a good weekend. Bye-bye now. Have a good, good weekend. Bye-bye. Yeah, stay safe, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.